Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's workshop, an online workshop talking about security in the cyber physical space. Uh, my name is Els, and I will be moderating the webinar in the background together with the speakers of today. Uh, I would just like to remind you that you're all muted during the presentations. If you can just continue to the next slide, please because the next, next slide will show you that you're muted indeed, that you do not have the possibility to uh, ask your questions out loud, but you do can enter your question in the Q&A panel of the Zoom webinar system. Uh, the speakers will have a look in the background after the presentation, uh, a look at your questions and then possibly already answer them during the presentations. If your question remains unreplied during this webinar, please do not um, be afraid or so, or bear in mind that we prepare a Q&A report that we will make available for you later on. We will also share the presentation with you later today. The webinar has been recorded, so you will also receive the link to the full recording uh, afterwards. Should you be on Twitter, feel free to talk about this workshop uh, with the hashtag training for standards, and you can find Sen and Senelec via the handle standards for EU. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our moderator of today. Uh, it's Mrs. Catherine. Catherine Piana. Uh, dear Catherine, please, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Els, um, and uh, welcome to, uh, uh, to the participants. And um, I'll, I'll make a short intro, but before that, I'd like to give the floor to Christina for a short introduction about Sen and Senelec. There's the floor is yours, Christina. Thank you so much, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Christina Thorngreen. I'm a project manager at the Sen and Senelec Management Center. Uh, I follow the security sector, and indeed, I'm here to give you uh, a few introductory words um, about Sen and Senelec. So together with Etsy, uh, Sen and Senelec make up the European standardization organizations recognized by European law in EU regulation 1025. Uh, and Sen and Senelec make up a network of uh, more than 200,000 um, experts uh, and are made up of 34 national members and also count on the involvement of different European organizations such as uh, trade and business associations, um, consumer organizations and also societal and environmental organizations. Um, and we also um, are strongly connected with uh, institutions and, and governmental bodies such as the European Commission and the European Free Trade Association. Um, and at the international level, we collaborate with ISO and IEC. Uh, so indeed, standardization occurs at different levels. Uh, at the national level, we, we have our, our national standards bodies, such as uh, Austrian standards or Danish standards or ASRO in Romania. Uh, and these are the members of Sen and Senelec and to a large extent also ISO and IEC. Um, so in fact, Sen will at times mirror the work of ISO and Senelec of IEC. And um, the aim is always to have, of course, an identical standard um, at the level, but also international. Uh, in fact, where possible, we aim to uh, seek a, a global solution. Um, and this partnership uh, or cooperation with ISO and IEC allows us to, um, to avoid any duplication of work and also to, um, to use our resources rationally. Um, now, maybe just a few words um, on SEN and SENELEC deliverables. So you have um, the European standard, uh, which is our prime deliverable. And this um, takes about two years to be developed. And then once it's adopted, it's automatically transposed uh, nationally, which means that one European standard then replaces 34 national standards. We can see here on the right an example of a, a cover page of a European standard. Then we have the technical specification that's considered a, a pre-standardization uh, deliverable, um, which can be useful in case perhaps there's not enough consensus to have a full European standard. Uh, then we have a technical report, which is in fact a sort of photography of the current state of the art. Um, it's, uh, it's an informative document or can also be a guide um, and takes about a year to develop. And then finally, we have the fastest and most agile deliverable, which is a workshop agreement. Um, and this is uh, developed by a workshop, which consists of 
different individuals or organizations who then come to an agreement on the, the content um, of, of this uh, workshop agreement. And, um, and now I will uh, hand you over into the capable hands of Catherine, who is indeed the moderator of today. Um, over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Christina, for giving us a, a very quick overview of uh, what is the tip of the iceberg of standardization. Um, for those who don't know me, I suppose there are many of you. Uh, Catherine Piana, I'm the Director General of uh, the Confederation of European Security Services, but I he I'm here in terms of uh, as a representative of uh, CEN TC 439, which I'm chairing, and CEN TC 439 looks after private security services. So a very good morning to you all, and uh, thank you for joining us in such big numbers. It's quite impressive. Uh, thank you also, Sen Senelec, for giving me the opportunity to facilitate this workshop on a very exciting uh, subject. And uh, thank you to the brave speakers who will try and map out what the cyber physical security challenge covers. Uh, Johan, Judith, Mate, and Alexis will help us map out the issue and share their insights and experience. They have prepared short interventions in order to leave time for questions and answers. But this is just the start of a conversation uh, which will continue for some time to come. But let's focus on today's agenda. Uh, today is about understanding uh, the blurring frontier between cybersecurity and physical security, and if there are any gaps between the two areas and hence vulnerabilities uh, that we should look after. And if there are uh, such vulnerabilities, uh, what kind of tools should we um, have in order to address them. Um, going to the next uh, slide, I thought it was useful to uh, look at some uh, definitions. Uh, the definition of cybersecurity, uh, which uh, is the definition of the Cybersecurity Act, and the definition of uh, CPS, uh, which stands for Cyber Physical Systems. Um, this definition is taken from a Newsweek Vantage report uh, entitled Weathering the Perfect Storm, which I really recommend you read if you're interested in cyber physical systems. And if you're here today, presumably uh, that is the case. And what I uh, underlined here is interact, because that's really what we're talking about, um, is this intersection between the physical world and the IT world. But is, um, is there actually a problem? Uh, is there a cyber physical uh, threat? Are these threats real? And if we go to the next uh, slide from, and as you see, I've taken a few graphs from this uh, Vantage, uh, Newsweek Vantage survey. Um, actually, if you look at the last 12 months, uh, and how respondents uh, answered the question, uh, are, have there been any security uh, incidents? Well, actually, uh, it's quite significant. And it's both ways, cyber incursion into IT, physical incursion into IT. Uh, so it's uh, clearly uh, a, a problem. Um, going to, to the next uh, slide. Oh, and by the way, this uh, Vantage survey um, is a survey that is global, um, covers about thousand of critical infrastructure of different uh, nature and size. So it's quite uh, representative. Now, uh, looking at the, the biggest risk, um, it's clearly IT systems, but also lack of IT OT integration. Um, also uh, physical access controls may be a risk and OT systems. Next slide, please. Now, uh, talking about integration, uh, only 20% uh, of all OT physical systems are integrated with externally accessible networks and 68% on the way to do so. So again, this highlights uh, the need to really look uh, into this, uh, this issue. And last uh, of my graphs, um, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what is the biggest threat? And if you look at employees current and in the fourth line, former employees, this category represents almost 70%. So we're talking about um, insider threats followed by uh, cyber criminal groups. So uh, clearly this is not a matter that you can um, address only with an IT response because it's a multi-faceted 
uh, issue. Um, so without further ado, uh, um, I'd like to pass on to, to, the, uh, to the speakers, but I'd like to just uh, say one thing. Um, I have actually given a little bit of an aviation focus uh, on this session. Um, just because uh, this is the ecosystem that is the most uh, advanced in terms of cybersecurity uh, legislation. But uh, I know that there are many uh, people uh, in, in this session who probably are not uh, in the aviation ecosystem. So it's just the idea to, okay, let's focus on this advanced uh, ecosystem and then see how it can be transposed uh, to other types of ecosystem. So um, I'll pass the floor to Johan, and then he will pass on the floor to Mate and Alexis from DG Move, and then finally to Judith Rosebo, and then we will have a Q&A session. So Johan, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Can everybody see me? OK. Um, no response. I can't see myself at this moment in time, but uh, thanks for uh, handing over the floor, Catherine, and um, for giving the opportunity to ASAI to be part of uh, this workshop. So also from my side, um, also from my side, a very uh, good morning. Just for clarity, uh, I'm not uh, an expert nor a specialist in, in cybersecurity, but the intention of uh, my presentation is more to give a general viewpoint of the growing importance of uh, cyber physical systems within the aviation uh, ecosystem. Next slide, please. <clears throat> It would be uh, an understatement mentioning that uh, the aviation ecosystem is complex because it is a very complex system uh, that consists out of uh, multiple stakeholders and uh, which all have different uh, objectives. <clears throat> Before in aviation, a lot of the systems used uh, at airports, they were linked with each other mainly in a closed network. Nowadays, it's completely different. It, there are highly interconnecting systems, even via the cloud. And we all know that, that the digitalization is increasing and has uh, an enormous impact on the way we work and also on the way we live. Introduction of uh, Internet of Things, the big data, the artificial intelligence, even the use of, of open architecture platforms, they are becoming more and more common in the development of, of new technologies, uh, not only within aviation, but also outside of, of aviation. So the digitalization is, is a global uh, game changer. And of course, that puts also uh, aviation operational systems at, at huge risk as well. So we all are aware that several attacks have taken place and have already disrupted uh, airport operations. Also attacks on, on uh, air traffic control systems have already grounded uh, hundreds of flights uh, in weak times. So uh, there is a big risk and, and not only an economical risk, the, the economic impact uh, of it, but there are also severe uh, risk for the security and the safety of, uh, of all the stakeholders uh, within the aviation ecosystem. <clears throat> Next slide, please. How about uh, cyber physical systems in aviation? Um, there are several definitions about uh, CPS, and uh, in her intro, uh, Catherine mentioned uh, mentioned one of it. But actually, it is the merger of of two worlds. It's it's on one hand the cyber world, and on the other hand the the physical world, which allows that. Uh, systems are uh, managed uh, from remote sites and, and in real time. Uh, so from any place uh, you can do that. And that is uh, to uh, optimize the processes, to have uh, processes, efficiencies, but also cost optimization. And certainly also improving the standards. Uh, we see that also that, that uh, 
replacing the human by new technology raises the standards and the level of standards as well in security as in safety. But also it has a benefit for the for the end user, for the passengers, for instance, in COVID, uh, for instance, has enhanced the implementation of uh, of new technologies, touchless technologies, so that the, the passengers feel more safety and that their health is also guaranteed in, in their seamless uh, travel. Um, <clears throat> You see on the picture, uh, you see an uh, air traffic uh, control center that is remote, eh, in which these uh, controllers are actually monitoring uh, and steering the landing and takeoffs and movement of aircraft on uh, on several airports, on which they don't uh, they don't have any physical presence, so it's completely remote. Uh, we see this also in, in the security and, and screening of passengers that um, today there are trials going on for the implementation of APID that is automated prohibited item detections uh, that are um, machine learning algorithms that are uh, added to the X-ray machines, and um, that will make possible that these machines will decide whether the bag is cleared to be secure or not. So the decision will not be taken by a human, the decision will be taken by the machine. So these are just a few examples uh, of, uh, of how the uh, operational systems uh, are remotely uh, managed and driven by by software but there are of course more smart developments uh, going on at this uh, moment in time and also in in other sectors as as mentioned by catherine next slide please <clears throat> so there is certainly a need uh, for uh, standards and for regulations. And so we welcomed the amendment of the EU Commission to the Aviation Security Regulation. And I will not elaborate furthermore on this because this will be done by my uh, fellow speakers uh, after my presentation. But it's interesting to see that the scope is of course uh, applying to all stakeholders uh, working and providing services at an airport. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So there are regulation is good and necessary and standards as well, uh, but there are some key challenges and, and one of these key challenges is certainly the harmonization because we all know that regulation and standards is one thing, but they also need to be incorporated uh, on, on a national level and even in some member states even into regional levels so uh, this is depending of course of uh, these countries and that might bring a different speed uh, on the level of harmonization <clears throat> also the difference in interpretation uh, could lead to uh, differences in implementation on operational levels so it is it is important that uh, and key that there is consistency in, in implementation in order to, yeah, to avoid uh, discrepancies in effectiveness. And as shown by the, the Vantage uh, survey uh, mentioned by uh, Catherine, there is a further need to the integration and to the cooperation between OT, IT and, and the physical uh, security. Just to close the gaps that are there and also to see that we can move on to a more integrated and certainly proactive protection measures that needs to be taken. <clears throat> And of course, the, the end user, the human, the human factor, although that um, humans are nowadays more and more replaced by technology, the human factor will continue to, uh, to play a crucial role in, into the process. <clears throat> but we also know <clears throat> that from the, the past that the human factor is often um, yeah, the weakest link uh, in the chain, actually. So we need to focus on that. <clears throat> and one item that is important is what if something happens 
I mean, who will be then responsible and, and who will be liable? And to what extent uh, will you be liable? <clears throat> because with the introduction of uh, artificial intelligence and, and the big digitalization, we are completely entering a new world. So, um, and we also know that cyber attacks and, and their possible outcome <clears throat> could be very dramatic. Um, and so I think that also the liability regime need to be addressed in, in a, a fair and, and a proportional way and certainly give priority to, uh, to critical infrastructure uh, of which uh, airports are certainly, uh, are certainly part. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> So what will be the way forward? Uh, certainly in, in the view of a, a further integration of uh, OT and, and IT, uh, we should map what's critical and, and prioritized based on risk assessment. And the outcome of that enhanced risk analysis would also allow us, uh, taking into account the, the new risk vectors, uh, to put in place the necessary uh, protection measures. And Catherine also mentioned it already, the insider threat, because we all know that cyber attacks can, place from, uh, can take place from any place uh, around the globe. <clears throat> but we may not neglect the threat that is nearby. Persons that have access to the systems or to the physical spaces where the systems are, like operators or uh, maintenance engineers or IT specialists, uh, we, need the, we need to monitor this uh, very closely. Of course, a, a focus on training to get, uh, to get the people understand uh, the reasons uh, of the measures and, and create awareness. So it's also a task of the, the stakeholders to, um, to develop a, a security culture. Uh, through all the levels in, in their organization. And of course, technology is moving fast. Uh, we all know that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a must that we keep our standards and our regulations updated almost at the same space. And I would recommend everybody to set up an internal quality control and compliance systems so that uh, everything can be updated and, and followed uh, in real time as well uh, to be in line with all these standards and with all the, the changes uh, going forward. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hand over the floor now to my fellow speakers of the EU Commission, Mate and Alexis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. I hope you can see me. Good morning, yes. everybody. Um, with my colleague, Alexi, who will follow me uh, uh, with the presentation, we thank uh, uh, San Senelec uh, for the uh, invitation. So I would like to make a short uh, introduction on the actual legal requirements on cybersecurity in the aviation field. I think Johan has made a very good policy um, uh, presentation on the policy context. So now we can have a look what are the actual um, uh, requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, I would like just to emphasize that uh, our regulation uh, actually has transposed uh, the ICAO requirements, ICAO being the International Civil Aviation Organization which is responsible for laying down the, um, the international standards or the global standards uh, in aviation security and in other uh, areas of aviation. So what we have transposed, of course, with some adjustments to take into account the European uh, environment, is very important that we are following the global standards uh, in this area as well. The uh, rules have been in place uh, only for a month, so the experience has been limited, but now uh, they have to be applied and the Commission will be there to, to check uh, what uh, has been put in place by the Member States and industry, 
So by time we will have more experience about the actual implementation of these requirements, which we will, we will be happy also to share with you to, to help. Um, uh, before the entry into force of the new requirements, of course, our member states and the industry had been preparing for the implementation. And we in DigiMove uh, have uh, provided guidance material to help uh, our um, colleagues one on the general um, uh, requirements, which I will uh, now go through, and one specifically on how to identify the critical ICT systems. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first um, uh, rule that we are having in the regulation 171 is the general uh, requirement on cyber protection in aviation security, which basically reads, as you see, that the operators, the air carriers and the entities, so all those which are covered by the EU aviation security regulations, they have to identify and protect their critical ICT systems and the data from cyber attacks. And importantly, these, these requirements are within the scope of security of civil aviation. And that's important because there are other, let's say, angles to cybersecurity. One in aviation being safety, where there are other efforts, uh, regulatory efforts to come up with some requirements. But these rules are constrained to uh, aviation security. Next slide, please. First of all, the air operators, the carriers, and the entities, uh, as it was in the general requirement, uh, have to identify the critical ICT systems and data. And on that basis, and within that scope, they shall introduce detailed measures to ensure the protection, the detection of, and response to, and recovery from cyber attacks. This is very important because the um, uh, all the both the identification and the detailed measures uh, to develop must be based on a risk assessment. And the risk assessment is important because that's where the different operators and these can adjust their um, protection measures to the risk uh, levels. A good example is the size of the company. I mean, for smaller companies, of course, they don't need to have the same level of protection. And this is through the risk assessment that they can identify what type of measures and what level of measures they have to put in place to ensure the um, uh, proper protection of their systems and data. Next, please. So background checks. Background checks is basically a, a relatively new requirement uh, in aviation security. It's a general requirement to cover the key staff of the uh, of the companies and uh, through this regulation the scope of the, the employees who have to go through background checks have been extended also uh, to the cyber um, uh, arena namely persons who have administrative administrator rights uh, or unsupervised and unlimited access to the critical ICT systems and data or otherwise identified in the risk assessment have to go through uh, background checks to uh, identify any risks that may, um, may be taken into account uh, before their uh, recruitment. Next, please. So the next uh, requirement uh, is about the training and access to information. And this is a more general requirement. Basically, all the persons, the employees who implement the cyber measures in a company, in an entity, have to have the necessary skills and aptitudes to carry out their designated tasks effectively. And this means that they must be trained uh, as, as uh, necessary as possible. And then they shall be also made aware of the relevant cyber risks in the company on a need to know basis. So the company has to have in place uh, some kind of uh, training and access to information uh, program uh, to ensure that these uh, requirements are met. 
The next one is about specific training, because of course, uh, there are the experts in the company, the cyber experts uh, who work uh, on a daily, daily basis with these systems, uh, administrators and others. And they uh, have to have uh, specific training um, and also, of course, made aware of the relevant risks, risks uh, maybe to a higher level than other employees. And uh, it's important that at this level, the appropriate authority, so the appropriate authority, meaning the, the state authority, which is responsible for aviation security. So this authority shall specify or at least approve the content of the course. So this is a more regulated area to ensure that the key staff uh, having access rights and working uh, with the the ICT systems have the necessary uh, training, uh, which is then uh, checked, uh, approved and checked by the uh, national authority. And on this slide, uh, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Alexi uh, to complete the uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mate. So for our next slide, we wanted to take you elsewhere and tell you a bit about the Transport Cybersecurity Toolkit, which is a project um, that DG Move published at uh, well last year, basically, and which is now available in all languages on our website. Uh, you have the link there. Also, try to put it in in the chat. And so basically, the toolkit started from the fact that, as uh, as Johan said previously, uh, the end user needs to be uh, educated, so to speak and that the human element uh, is often the weakest link in, in the cybersecurity chain. So what the toolkit does is to, uh, is to list some uh, practical tips and recommended practices uh, to enhance cyber awareness in transport uh, companies. So there's really a focus on the transport sector. Uh, the aim is to cover all the modes, so not only aviation, because as we heard, there's already some legislation in aviation, which is not the case uh, necessarily in other modes. So yeah, we, we have a broad uh, scope. Uh, all modes and also in the toolkit uh, we have two levels so one that we call uh, basic and uh, which is really for for people who have no uh, expertise in in cyber and then there's a more advanced uh, level so so the focus of the toolkit is not necessarily to be uh, specifically on the on the physical cyber dimension but certainly it's uh, it's it's covered by some practices and i put uh, an examples uh, a couple of examples on the slide so you see the first one which is again really basic it's in green because it's in the basic level it's just to lock systems uh, both physical, physically and digitally when not, uh, not attended. And then uh, in orange, the, 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 some of the practices that appear in the more advanced level. And there you can see uh, things such as uh, implementing access control or uh, revoking the credentials when uh, an employee uh, leaves the company or, or terminates the contract. So that's for the toolkit. Uh, please have a look. I'll put the link in, uh, in the chat and I uh, give the floor back to uh, the well, next speaker. I'm not sure who that is. Thank you. Okay, hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, um, so thanks and um, hello, and thanks for inviting me to give a presentation today. It's really interesting to hear about the different aspects of challenges we are all facing. The topic of my presentation is the EN IEC 62443 series of standards for operational technology. And I'd like to focus on how these standards help us in the cyber physical space. Um, before moving to the next slide, I would like to say a few words about operational technology and information technology. Operation technologies encompass use of ICT to control physical processes. So this means there's a difference between OT and IT. And cybersecurity is often associated with both information technology and operation technology. In IT, the focus is on protecting data flow in the virtual world. Whereas in operational technology, the focus is on protecting the physical process, which is controlled by IT. And critical infrastructures, such as utility grids and systems, and the automated environments used in factories, refineries, and industrial, industrial Internet of Things, have security requirements that are all part of the real world. And they rely on operational technologies to ensure the correct execution of automated actions, such as shutting down a vault to present the hazarded conditions, such as a gas leak or an overflow of chemicals. 
Next slide, please. And because operation technologies are cyber physical systems, the impact of a cyber attack could be severe. And indeed, there are real examples of cyber attacks with impact on the physical world. In 2008, a schoolboy hacked into the tram switching communications in Lutz, Poland, causing four trams to derail and 12 people were injured. And in 2010 with Stuxnet, we have the first known case of mail that, that was designed to attack the control system and damage the physical process under control. Then both in 2015 and 2016, there are two cases of deliberate coordinated cyber attacks causing power outages in the Ukraine. The second of these with automated malware. Recently, an attempt was also made to manipulate the water treatment software at a water treatment plant with the aim to cause water poisoning by increasing chemical levels to dangerous levels. So using IT to control a physical process means risk for health, safety, and the environment. And because of this, it's important to have cybersecurity standards that address the security of the cyber physical process that, sorry, the, the, the security of the physical process that's being operated by IT. So about 20 years ago, work on the 62443 series was initiated to address the security of industrial communication networks and industrial automation and control systems. And the aim was to address cyber security risks to critical infrastructures and processes. Cybersecurity includes more than technology. It also requires a combination of the people and the work processes needed to ensure the security of the control system, people, processes, and technology. And the work initiated by ISA 99 20 years ago has grown to a series of nine published standards and reports. And the series continues to be developed, extended, and harmonized. In Europe, the series is published as ENIEC 62443. The aim is to give a systematic approach to the cyber security of operational technologies based on an understanding of the threats and risk landscape. And the standards are already today applied across a wide range of sectors that include utility grids and systems, hydropower facilities, offshore wind, railway, shipping and aviation, building control, industrial automation and industrial internet of things. And so how does 62443 make this happen? With a defense in depth approach via risk-based risk assessment for partitioning of systems into zones and conduits that focuses on the protection of the critical assets. Organization and technical security requirements are specified at the system level and at the component level. And the series of standards recognizes that cybersecurity is a continuous process and that there are no simple solutions. So it's important to have in place organizational measures such as security monitoring and procedures for responding to incidents. Cybersecurity requires a combination of countermeasures that all contribute to the security of the operational technology in the physical world. Next slide, please. The 62443 series of standards is being developed in close cooperation by two groups, ISA 99 and IEC TC65 Working Group 10. And the standards are then published at European level as EN IEC 62443 through Senelec TC65X and the parallel voting procedures that are in place. But it's also important that the committees cooperate with ISO also to ensure that the 62443 series complements the more general cybersecurity standards in the 27,000 series. Therefore, there's a formal liaison in place between IEC TC65 and ISO IEC JTC1 to cooperate on the development of cybersecurity standards. The 62443 series is broadly used across industrial domains and is now being developed to be able to be used easily across the different domains. For example, energy industries, discrete manufacturing, process control, switch gear, smart manufacturing, power and water, oil and gas and chemicals, railway, healthcare, aviation. 
And at the end of last year, the IEC officially designated the IEC 62443 series of standards as horizontal. This means that they are proven to be applicable to a wide range of different industries. And Senelec TC65X already has a resolution in place to ensure that the standards can be adopted at EU level as horizontal for operational technology. Next slide, please. So to wrap up this presentation, this slide shows the parts of the IEC 62443 series that are considered as horizontal standards. And on the right side of the standard is a view of the different committees in the IEC that are either already today referencing the 62443 series in their standards, and that may potentially reference the standards in the future. The 62443 approach is based on a systematic risk assessment of complex systems. And the seven parts in the series form the basis for this approach. So first, concepts and models are, that are used across the series are de defined in part 1-1. And in part 2-1 part is complementary to ISO IEC 27001 and 2 and describes requirements on site owners, plant factory owners for establishing an operational technology security program. And one of the requirements is to have an information security management system, according to, for example, 27,000. Part 2-4 specifies security requirements for service providers. That means requirements on the security capabilities of the services and on the service offerings. And in part 3-2, a process for cybersecurity risk assessment of the complex system is described. And the process can, that is described in the standard can easily fit into the more general process described in 27,005. Part 3-3 specifies technical requirements at the system level and 4-2 technical requirements at the component level. And in part 4-1, there's, there's the product development lifecycle requirements. That is the process that is, are needed to be in place covering the entire lifecycle of an operational technology component. Please click once. So cybersecurity is an ongoing process and there are no simple solutions. And cybersecurity must be seen as a collaborative project. We need the right combination of technological mechanisms to secure the system, as well as having in place experienced processes and procedures and having the right people with knowledge of security and safety according to the job. And the aim is to protect the physical process. Next slide, please. And just in case you are not convinced, this is what the future may hold if we do not take care of cybersecurity in the physical world. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Judith, and uh, thank you all the, the speakers for, first of all, sticking to time, but also uh, covering uh, the, the, uh, this, uh, mapping out this, this issue uh, that we're, we're trying to, uh, to map out. And Judith, uh, this is quite a scary a uh, picture there that you've uh, that you've posted. Um, before going to the questions in the Q and A uh, thread, uh, I've I've seen a, a few. I'd like to ask a question to to each of you. Um, to you, Johan, I'd like to ask, um, in your opinion, uh, how ready how ready are aviation stakeholders in the face of cyber physical threats? I could even say on a scale of zero to ten. Catherine. That is uh, not an easy question, of course, eh? because you need to have an over, uh, a complete overview, and um, which I don't have at this moment in time, eh? because uh, if, if you look on a global level, uh, it's, it's hard to tell. I think if we look more on a European level, then I would think that, that uh, around 60 to 70 percent uh, would, be, would be ready. Um, but 
it's it's like I said, there are countries that are leading uh, as well on that harmonization and the implementation and, and still a lot of work to do on the integration and a lot uh, are running a bit behind, but but are catching are catching up. The question is, can you ever be ready? Uh, I mean, uh, at a certain moment in time. I think uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, technology and, and are getting, is getting more sophisticated and, and so are cyber attacks that are getting more sophisticated. So I think it is also important that, that uh, we, we take uh, the necessary lessons out of, of uh, the incidents what happened in the past and, and also in the incidents that will come to the future. And there was a question uh, asked in, in, in that way, uh, what, what can the standard, uh, and I think it was from Mike uh, St. John, I believe, uh, what can a standard help in, in logging uh, and, and so on? I think it's, it would be important to have a, a reporting system in place uh, when uh, an attack happens that it is locked, but uh, not only locked, but also shared uh, with uh, with the other players, because uh, as we learned out of the past, the sharing of intelligence is some 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 way hard because it's always about sensitive data we saw that at 9 11 and with other incidents that uh, a lot of intelligence was available but was not shared and i think that we need to take take that lesson with us and 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 that will be the only way that we will be ready uh, in in some way thank you very much and indeed uh, that is one of the uh, issues we we face that um, uh, companies are not uh, willing to report because they feel uh, that they are weakening themselves by by reporting incidents. So that's uh, that's something that's definitely uh, noted. Um, to you, Judith, listening to Johan's presentation and uh, as an expert in cybersecurity and also knowing the IEC 62443 series, which is quite complex, I have to say, um, <laughs> would the implementation of the standard be sufficient to cover the threats and risks uh, that uh, were highlighted, for example, by Johan? Yes, so um, thanks for this question. Um, I do think that the 62443 series can contribute to countering the threats and risks that are in the scope of the physical, cyber physical aspects of the um, operational technologies used in the aviation ecosystem. I think in particular in the ground on operations management and in the various control systems operating in the airport environment. And also, especially as the degree of automation processes increases, I think that these standards will be more and more useful. But I would, I should also point out that 62443 alone does not cover all aspects of the ecosystem. And for this, you will need other standards such as 27,000. And also the standards writing is in ongoing process also. And um, I think that we should keep, keep that in mind that we need to continue to develop the standards and bring them to the market in a timely manner to address the threats and risks. Thank you, Judith, and uh, I take the opportunity to say yes, there is also another gap, which is the gap between standards writing and the legislative world sometimes. And uh, I sometimes try and do the bridge between the two, uh, but it's not so easy. And so this uh, is the right moment in time to uh, pass the floor to the Commission, <laughs> uh, to Matt and Alexis. Um, um, in your opinion, are the tools uh, provided by the cybersecurity legislation and the toolkit sufficient to cover the cyber physical threats as described today? Do you expect that other legislation existing or in progress will add to these tools? And I'm thinking in particular about the Critical Entities Resilience Directive or the NIST 2 Directive. And just one point uh, on, on these two, um, we were a little bit disappointed uh, and that, that's not a remark to you, of course, uh, it's a general remark that uh, critical entities uh, on the one hand side dealing mainly with physical and NIST 2 directive dealing mainly with IT uh, were two different texts and in the future, uh, I hope that these will be integrated, but that's not a, a remark for you, basically, um, to, to my question, uh, uh, Alexis or and or Mate. Yeah, thanks, Katrin. I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. 
Um, well, I think that the, the legislation that Mate talked about in this presentation was about aviation. And of course, transport is wider than aviation and transport is only one uh, sector. Uh, and as for the toolkits, it, it's, it mostly deals with, uh, with, with cyber awareness. So as you say, we have these two legislation uh, on the way. Uh, you said it yourself, the, the Directive on Resilience is more geared towards uh, physical security and the NIS more geared towards cybersecurity. But this being said, there are some, uh, some built-in mechanism in these two directives to ensure that there's a, a good uh, coherence um, to address precisely this physical cyber dimension. And, and I think what's also interesting is that uh, the council, so the member states, in its position on the NIS directive, uh, try to uh, strengthen the cyber physical dimension by saying that entities that are covered by the NIS directive um, also have to protect their network and information systems and the physical environment from events such as uh, theft, fire, flood, uh, unauthorized access. So you see uh, there's really a, a process of, of trying to reinforce this uh, this dimension. Of course, you will see where the negotiations on those two texts uh, will evolve and will land later in the year, but certainly uh, we could expect that there's, uh, there's more on the way. Thank you very much, uh, Alexis. And um, now I'm looking at uh, the Q&A and one uh, question immediately uh, pops to my mind because it probably, um, let's say, uh, goes in the direction uh, that um, the document, uh, the, the, the report um, is, is also going, the, the Newsweek Vantage report. And uh, it's a question from uh, Jean-Philippe Berillon. Don't we face a rising combination of physical and cyber attacks, which means that approach needs to be holistic? Now, who would like to take up that question? Um, any volunteers in the, in the panel? Uh, who wants to uh, talk about holistic uh, between physical and cyber. Um, maybe if uh, you don't raise your hand, then I, I will pass the floor to you. Um, Johan, do you want to take up that question about a holistic approach to physical and cyber attacks? Sorry to put you in the spotlight. No, Otherwise, thank you. Sorry? I was going to say I could say a few words, but go ahead, Jan, go ahead. No, no go ahead, go ahead, Alexis. I leave all the right. floor to the European Commission. Oh, yeah, thanks to kind of you. No, I think uh, we can all agree on, uh, on that. And in fact, uh, the EU uh, Security Union strategy from, from 2020 really seeks to, uh, to, to, to strengthen the interconnection and interdependency between physical and, uh, and, and cyber security. And with what I try to explain on, on the, the two directives which are on the way, which arguably or distinct, but still they, they, they really uh, uh, should work well together. We, we try to have a, a holistic and comprehensive approach uh, to this. So that's, that's what I would say on, uh, on, on this question. Thank you, Alexis. Johan. I have nothing to add to that, uh, Catherine. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, Right. Now, there's a few questions here about uh, 62443. Some uh, quick ones maybe for you, Judith. Uh, are there any plans to harmonize any parts of ENIEC 62443? When is the next version? So I'm not sure if you are, uh, if you are able to answer these futuristic questions. Okay. Yes, um, the, the different parts of the series are each going according to their life cycle of the writing and the, and the different editions. So there are different versions being processed um, continuously. Um, um, if you're thinking about uh, the, the horizontal, the current plan says by 2027, but of course we would like that to be um, even more timely with respect to the market. Regarding the harmonization of the standards, that depends on, on the directive and, and the fit of the requirements to the different parts of the legislation. So I would rather not say uh, concretely at this point, but I do see that a lot of there, there are very many requirements in the, in the standards that are applicable to the different parts of the legislation. Okay, thank you, Judith. And of course, there is no telling 
about uh, <laughs> exact dates <laughs> in the world, in the magical world of standards. Um, <laughs> going through the thread, and I don't want to leave the first uh, questions out. Uh, um, there's a question here uh, about um, online training for cabin crew and what extra measures can we take to protect sensible data? And I suppose that um, the, the, the issue really is that uh, it's a holistic uh, approach, as we, as we said. So I guess there's no one simple answer to, to this question, unless the Commission uh, or you, Johan, wants to uh, add anything. I guess um, you have to look at all, uh, you have to carry out a risk analysis. And uh, this, also, um, uh, this also links with okay, you're doing a risk analysis, but zero risk doesn't exist. So it's all a risk. Uh, what risk are you ready to accept? And that's, uh, I think, something each organization or ecosystem needs to, needs, needs to decide. Um, do, does anybody want to add anything about uh, extra measures for cabin crew, uh, in addition to the current already, uh, the, the, the current obligations? No, I think, uh... Catherine, that uh, it is also depending on the type of systems uh, and uh, the technology that uh, you have in, in place. Uh, but you can protect your own systems uh, in, in such online um, uh, webinars, but uh, you don't know, and it has been mentioned before, the end user, you don't know on what uh, system he or she is working and how uh, his network is or, or how much it is protected. So it's a bit more from the, the practical side. Um, but you mentioned there, and it was also a question, uh, which, which risk can we accept? Uh, and who will decide uh, on, on the acceptance of risk um, also into a holistic approach? That's a very difficult, uh, that's a very difficult question uh, to answer. So what, what risk are we willing to accept? And, and are we aware of, of different types of risk? Uh, because you can not foresee the, the unforeseenable, of course. And um, I think, like you mentioned, everybody needs to, to point this out for their own systems, but it would be good also that there would be um, some guidelines uh, to what is acceptable or not. And then I look more to, to appropriate authorities uh, to, to, take, to take a bit a lead into that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Johan, for your uh, dual answers. Uh, if the Commission wants to add to, to this about acceptable level of risk, Uh, yes, thank you, Catherine. Maybe I could add a few words about risk uh, assessment in general, because I think there were also a few other questions about this. So that's that's basically um, the underlying concept um, uh, in uh, aviation security in general, not only in cybersecurity. And the risk assessment is the responsibility of the entities, so the uh, airports, the airlines, the other entities um, in, the, in the ecosystem. However, uh, they can uh, look uh, for support uh, first from, from the national uh, agencies, the aviation security agency or the cyber uh, agency to uh, advise them uh, what methodologies they should apply, uh, how to do it. And um, it's very important also that there's a legal requirement uh, for the authorities to share uh, relevant risk analysis that they have uh, at national level with the industry. That's also part of our regulation. I didn't mention it specifically. But again, that's a general uh, rule uh, in uh, the whole world of aviation security. So I would really advise um, uh, the industry to, to contact the, uh, the authorities. Thank you very much, uh, Alexis. And I'm conscious of time, and it's already 11 o'clock, so we should be closing. Um, as Els highlighted at the beginning of this session, um, there will be a, a catalog of questions and answers circulated 
uh, after this session. So, and as I said at the beginning, this is really the just the beginning of a conversation. Um, I don't know if somebody from Sen Senelec, uh, 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 Christina, if you want to uh, make a quick advertising for these workshops, I give you the floor. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, this is uh, just to, to show you that this first um, workshop is part of a, a series of three in total. Um, so you have the dates um, uh, here below. Um, and um, there will also be a, uh, an event uh, in May taking place to kind of uh, bring together all the subjects that were brought up in each of these workshops. So look out for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, am I supposed to be closing the session? <laughs> You're welcome to. Yeah, let's okay. do it. Well, um, just I want to give a quick thank you uh, to, to you from, from Sen Senelec to the participants and also